Well, we are live. And look at that. Here I am. Don't answer that question. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jerry Oginski, and welcome to the second edition. Here we go. Second edition of Objection. Don't answer that question. Just give me a few moments to get started. We're going to get set up, and we're going to have our second edition talking about what? Objection. Don't answer that question. For those of you who are just going to be joining me, it's going to be real people, real cases, real lawyers with real results. Remember, don't answer that question. There we go. Okay. So now we are live here on Facebook. And for those of you who have not yet seen the first episode, what I want to do is I want to welcome you to, what's the show name? Objection. Don't answer that question. Here we go. The whole purpose of this show is to show you real lawyers, real dramatic moments, real cases, and real results. That's the whole purpose here. So your goal is, as somebody who's watching, as somebody who's going to be viewing, is to ask questions. And if you think during the course of reading, let's say, a deposition or a cross-examination, you don't understand or you don't know why an attorney has been asking a certain question, I don't want you to go ahead and continue watching without raising your hand and say, wait a second, what does that mean? Ask the question, okay? There are no questions that you cannot ask. So I encourage you, in fact, I want you to go ahead and ask questions, why? Because this show is all about real cases, real lawyers, real results, and real people. And so that's your goal as a viewer who's coming in to watch, who's seeing this in the Facebook news feed. Your goal is to actually engage with me because I want you to ask questions. I want, your, I want you to learn the strategies that trial attorneys have when we ask questions, when we give opening statements, when we do closing remarks, when we do direct examination. There's lots of strategies behind what goes on in a trial involving an accident matter or medical malpractice or even wrongful death. So again, don't answer that question. We're going to get started in just a moment, but again, keep this in mind as we're going through and come in, ask your questions, but don't answer that question. Raise an objection. Say, wait a second, I have an objection. My objection is I don't understand this particular topic. I don't understand your strategy for why you did that. Ask that question. The moment you do that, guess what? Now all of a sudden you'll have a better understanding of exactly what's going on. All right? So in another 15 seconds, we're going to get started. And here we go. Michael, how are you? Nice to see you. Glad you could join me. This is objection. Don't answer that question. It's better than any reality show. You're going to see real people, real lawyers, real cases, and real results. Hey, look at that. I have Rob Anspach on here too. Objection. Why aren't more lawyers doing live video? That's a great question. I'll tell you why. It's because they haven't yet seen this episode and they haven't yet seen this show. Samson, nice to see you. How are you? That's why they haven't done live video like this. It's because it's so engaging and it's so interesting. And my quest here is to have you, the viewer, ask questions. I want you to engage. I want your answer. No, I'm going to give you the answers, but I want your questions so that we can share with you the different strategies. James, nice to see you and thank you so much for that comment. Um, I really appreciate it. James says, loves your videos. Great. Uh, this video is about live video, about objection, don't answer that question. It's about real cases and lawyers who try cases and they'll show you different strategies that come up in the questions that are asked, in the opening arguments, in the closing arguments. And you should know that there are key strategies to use when handling a trial. So here we go. Ready? Let's get to it. And by the way, don't be afraid to raise your hand and ask that question. So now, I'm going to take you back to the first episode. In the first episode, I was talking about a case that I handled many, many years ago. In fact, going back to May of 1990, it was a case I tried where I was a defense attorney. 
and I was representing a hotel in the mountains, in the Poconos. And in that instance, this was a case where I have here the actual transcript of my opening arguments as well as my closing arguments. So this is a real case. I represented a, a resort called Winter Clove, and they were being sued by a guest who had gotten hurt at the resort. Hey, how are you guys? Nice to see you. So this is going back 26 years, and I couldn't even believe that I found this transcript hidden in my files. I decided to pull it out and start reading it, and it brought back tons of memories. So here's what happened during the course of this trial. And let me set the scene for you because I think it's important before I get right into the summation that I'm going to actually read to you. Read my summation. So here's the scenario. I'm in practice now 28 and a half years. I had been in practice for just two years at the time. And now I'm asked to represent this hotel who is being sued by one of the guests who got injured in a sledding accident in the middle of the winter. So what did I have to do? I actually went on a beautiful day in the summer when I was assigned to this case and I actually drove up three, three and a half hours up to this resort. I needed to see for myself exactly where this place was. I wanted to see what was around there. I wanted to see the buildings, the layouts, the structure, the driveway, everything where this incident occurred. Why is that important? It's important for an attorney to understand and get a feel for exactly what happened. Why? Because we weren't there. So we have to recreate in our minds exactly where people were, what they were doing, what they were using, and now try and figure out, is he right? Is this possible that the incident happened this way or did it happen this way? Why was he over here? Why was he going down this sled? Why was he on this hill? Why wasn't he over there? Did he ask anybody to be on this hill? Did he ask where he can go sledding? Whose sled was this? Okay. So now you have a better understanding of exactly why I needed to make a trip upstate New York to go ahead and to visualize for myself where this place was, what this guy was doing, and why he was doing it. So what did I do? I drove up there. I spent the day up there with my client. And here's what I found out. What I found out was that this guy was about, I don't know, 180 pounds from what I recall. He was six foot tall, young guy, gone up with his wife and another couple, and it was a beautiful winter weekend. But now they get up there, they want to go sledding. So this guy actually took, he took a sled that was leaning against some, some building, and he took it. But this sled wasn't an ordinary sled. It was a kid's flying saucer. Now you know, you know that a flying saucer has no controls, right? You can't steer it, you can't slow it down, you just sit on it and maybe you've got some handles and that thing spins around as you go down the hill. That's what makes it so much fun as a kid. This was a kid's toy. This guy got on it and now went down the hill. And he claimed that as he went down the hill, it started spinning around. He's going down backwards. And now at the bottom of the hill, he claims that something was at the bottom of the hill causing him to hit it, go flying up, and now he fractured his tailbone, his coccyx. And so he sues the resort. So now let me take you to closing arguments. This is Mineola. The attorney I'm trying the case against is a very famous attorney, a plaintiff's attorney, somebody who had gotten a remarkable verdict against the New York City Transit Authority in the case he tried right before mine. He got a multi-million dollar verdict. Great attorney. And here I was, this young kid with only two years out of law school trying this case in Mineola in May of 1990. So here we go. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We've reached that part of the case that's now called summation. Now I'm in front of the jury. I'm talking to these people. Thanks so much for the thumbs up. I'm talking to the jury as if I'm talking to you right now. And I'm standing there having a conversation with them. All right, I'd like to provide a brief overview of what I believe the evidence has shown in this case. Everybody loves winter sports, hiking, skiing, tobogganing, sledding, ice skating. It's a great thing. It's a great feeling. You love the cool wind blowing your face, going through your hair. I don't have much hair left now anyway. Going through your body. It's a wonderful feeling. Hey, Ronnie, nice to see you. But along with those exciting feelings of the cool rushing wind in your face, along with that excitement comes certain risks. And with those risks come danger. 
And a person who knows of those risks and places themselves in an element of danger, yet does the activity anyway, must be held responsible for their actions. Thanks so much for the thumbs up. Now, why am I telling the jurors about this, that, you each, that each person has to be accountable for their actions? I'm telling them as part of a strategy that, listen, our defense is this guy was an adult. He knew what he was doing. He knew that there are inherent risks with different winter activities. And you should know, and I mentioned this in the first episode of this show, objection, don't answer this question. The, uh, one of the issues that arose during the trial was that I wanted to show to the jury what this flying saucer really was. That this little pie dish, not so little, but this pie dish was something that this adult man was sitting on. Okay, And now the judge would not allow me to show the jury this big pie dish that I had gotten from the toy store during the middle of the trial. Why not? Because the injured patient, not patient, the injured victim did not say that that's what he used, even though it was similar. So there was a whole big issue because later on when I got up to cross-examine him, I then pulled this thing out from behind a trial exhibit I had in an attempt to question him. And when the plaintiff's attorney, his attorney turns around, hey guys, nice to see you. When he turns around and sees me holding this thing that the judge told me I could not use, the attorney started flipping out. He started freaking out. He started objecting, jumping up and down. Judge, he can't do that. You can't do that. You already ruled on that. And you know what? I got a lot of heat for that. The judge yelled at me, he almost held me in contempt. And, but I had to do that. I had to show the jury that what this guy did was he assumed the risk of injury. Now, nobody wants anybody to ever get injured, but I will tell you, this guy assumed the risk. <laughs> Excuse me, <coughs> just getting over a sinus infection. So let me take you on further in this summation to show you what I'm trying to do. I want the jury to picture themselves at this resort, the cool fresh air and the big mountains, how what beautiful scenery it is. Great winter sports are available. Sure, you can do those winter sports and you can do them at my client's resort, but you've got to be smart about it. And if you're not, and you assume the risk for your own injury. So here we go. Some winter sports can be, term, can be termed user controlled. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, like skiing, for example, someone with skis, boots, poles, a person skiing can actually steer. A person skiing can slow down. They can change direction. They can come to a stop. Unlike sledding, especially here with the kind of sled that was used here. Now you saw the type of sled that was used in this case, this plastic disc, flexible flyer, this plastic thing, maybe 30 inches in diameter, pretty small, maybe a little bigger, maybe a little less. This thing has no brakes. It has no steering mechanism. The thing has no control, none, none whatsoever. So you get on this thing and you're just going and going and there's no way to control it. Plus it spins. This thing spins as you're going down and that's what makes it so much fun. You know, it's a great thing to be on as a kid. So picture this. So now, and I tell the jury, I said, picture this. Why? Because I want them to see what's going on in the mind of this injured victim. I want them to visualize being at this resort. And the only way I can get them to do that without saying, hey, ladies and gentlemen, put yourself in my client's shoes or put, them, put yourself in the injured victim's shoes, which we cannot do for a strategic reason. Instead, I want to put them in the place where this incident occurred. So picture this, if you will. Beautiful northern Catskill region. Beautiful country area up at a place called Winter Clove. It's winter. Hey, Ed, how are you? Igor, nice to see you. Up at a place called Winter Clove. It's winter. It's January 1984. And what's the name of the show? You know it. It's Objection. Don't answer that question. There we go. Yes, it is a mirror image, Ed, and I am aware of that. It's because I've got the front-facing camera, actually rear-facing camera. If I turn the lens around, then it's going to look like that. So that's why it's turned around a bit. Okay, so here we are. It's winter, January 1984. It's a cool, windy day. It's a nice day. It's late afternoon, 4.35 o'clock, and it had snowed recently. A foot of snow on the ground, a beautiful place to be. Fresh air, a wonderful place. So what do we have? We have the plaintiff, the plaintiff as the injured victim. Where are we? 
and his wife going to a hill that they claim they were directed to go to. Going to a hill that they got on and they started to sled on. Now, who was it who directed these people to go to this hill? Who was it? In 1982 or 1983, whatever they were there before, they said somebody, somebody, they don't know who, directed them to this hill. In 1984, the time that this happened, somebody directed them. They can't describe them. They can't tell you, thanks for the thumbs up. They don't know what they were wearing. They don't know who they were. But isn't it convenient, isn't it convenient, ladies and gentlemen, that these people can't describe who they are, what they are, when they did, but there are a lot of other details about this case, a lot of other inconsistent details. I submit to you that no employee of this hotel ever directed these people. Now, the defense, the plaintiff's attorney, he yells out, object to that, Your Honor, Mr. Jacobs says. There's no testimony in this case. What do I say? This is my conclusion. The plaintiff's attorney says, it's not his conclusion, objection. So he's standing up and yelling at the judge because he wants to be noticed. And he's making a legal objection, claiming that there's no evidence of that in this case. I'm saying that's the conclusion that I want the jury to draw. So now, very interesting. The court says, can you read that? No. It says, counselor, don't interrupt, meaning to my opponent. Don't give me arguments. You've made an objection and an exception. An exception is where the attorney doesn't agree with the judge's ruling. He says, the objection is overruled. Counsel is doing what I've instructed the jury that you are both entitled to do, which is to give your impression of what the evidence is in this case, and the jury will then determine. You are giving an argument and only an argument. Go ahead, counsel, meaning referring to me, I can continue my closing argument. You should know that in a civil lawsuit in New York, in a case involving an accident matter or medical malpractice or even wrongful death, the person who is defending the case is the one who makes closing arguments first. You wanna know why? It's because the injured patient's attorney, the injured victim's attorney, is the one who gets the last word. So that's traditionally why the defense lawyer will go first to make his closing remarks, and then the injured patient, I'm sorry, the injured victim's attorney, or the injured patient's attorney, known as the plaintiff's attorney, will then go ahead and make his closing remarks last. Now, technically, the attorneys are not the ones who get the last word in. You know who it is? The judge gets the last word because the judge is the one who then gives the jury legal instructions that they have to follow in order to answer a series of questions to reach their verdict. So again, I wanna welcome you to this show. It's called Objection, Don't Answer That Question. Your goal as a viewer here is to engage with me, to ask me questions about strategy, about why things were done, you're going to have lots of drama in this show explaining why, explaining how, where, when, during the course of questioning, during the course of cross-examination, during the course of direct examination, at all points during a trial. And I'm going to invite different lawyers on here to go ahead and take you through, just as I'm doing now, to take you through and recreate the actual trials that occurred using real cases, real people, real witnesses, and real results. So if you have questions, remember, raise your objection, raise your hand, ask the question. Then remember the name of the show is called Objection. Don't answer that question. I'll answer it for you. So I wanna welcome you and thank you for being here. And now let's get back to my summation in this sledding accident case here in New York. So now we've just had an incident where the defense, no, nope, I'm the defense attorney, where the injured victim's attorney has just objected to something I said during closing arguments. Give me one second. Traditionally, an attorney is not supposed to interrupt another lawyer when they're making closing arguments or opening arguments. But in this case, he felt it necessary to go ahead and make that, make that objection. So now when that happens, I have to pause for a moment the judge has to evaluate whether or not the objection is appropriate. If the objection is appropriate and the judge agrees with the lawyer, then he's going to say objection sustained, which means to me, I can't continue talking about that issue or I can't ask that question. If the judge disagrees with that lawyer making the objection, he says objection overruled, which is exactly what he said here. 
Objection overruled, which means I can continue going on and continuing with my line of question, questioning or with my line of thought. So now, welcome, thanks for joining me. Here we go. I submit to you that no employee of this hotel ever told these people to use this hill. That if they were to ask, if they were to ask, and if they had asked where they were told to go, it would be far, far away from the main house, by the bowling alley. And who better to know this than this gentleman who was my client, who oh, was he the manager or the owner of the resort? Oh, here, this is the son of the owner who worked at this place all his life, who grew up here. So who better to ask? He knows that if people ask, they're directed to the slope by the bowling alley. Now, why? I ask that question, why? Because it's a safer place to sleigh ride. It's a safer place. You heard the owner. You heard him tell you why he thought that area was not safe. Why did he say, why did he say that? Because of obstructions, because of a lot of trees, because of a cement barbecue pit three feet high. Mind you, there was testimony of only one foot of snow. Now, you should know that when I did Excellent, excellent. Um, thank you so much for joining me. When I did go upstate to visit my client's hotel resort, when I did that, you know what's really cool? I saw the bottom of the hill where this guy apparently was sledding. And you know what I saw? I saw that there was a roadway at the bottom of that hill that bisected the bottom of that roadway. But that roadway was defined by railroad ties. So you have raised railroad ties that are sitting a little bit elevated above the actual roadway. But now there's snow there. So now this guy's coming down the hill and he claims that he hit something, he doesn't know what, that caused him to jump up. And for all I know, he might have hit that railroad tie. But how is the resort responsible for him hitting that railroad tie? Was it a hidden danger? Was this something that should have been disclosed to him? Should there have been signs saying, don't sled here, don't go skiing here, don't walk here because there are railroad ties adjacent to this roadway. Is that what we should have done? The answer is no. You see, when you're using your common sense, you have to take responsibility for your own actions. And if you don't, now you're in a situation like this where you bring a lawsuit claiming that someone else is responsible. Somebody else has to be responsible. I got injured at this resort, therefore somebody needs to be sued. Okay, well, he had a right to bring a lawsuit. But guess what? We had a right and an obligation to defend the case. And in this instance, what happened here? So here's another strategy, right? The strategy was that this guy wasn't taking care and holding himself accountable for his own injuries. Instead, he was trying to blame someone else. And he should have been accountable for his own injuries. But in fact, he wasn't. He was placing the blame on somebody else. And you know what? There are instances where it's appropriate to turn around and say, hey, don't blame me. I'm an innocent bystander. Or I'm an innocent victim. I had no way of knowing the following things existed. And that may be true. But in this instance, this guy undertook to go ahead and go sledding in an area that he never should have gone sledding. He went ahead and took a child's toy without asking permission from anyone basically stole it or borrowed it um, and then when he's on this toy and he's assuming the risk of injury for doing what it's supposed to do spin around and go backwards and go fast down a hill in the snow time and he gets hurt now he turns around and says you the resort you should have known about this how could we have known about it how could we know that a grown man is going to take a kid's sled and go sledding in an area he's not supposed to there's no way to know. So let's see what the transcript shows. Thanks so much for joining me. Here we go. All right. Because of a telephone pole, because of a roadway traveled and used at the base of this hill, that's why it wasn't a safe place to sled. We're still up at the hill now. Now remember, I still want the jury to visualize where we are, where they are, where the injured or soon to be injured victim is. We're still up at the hill. The owner of the resort sees his wife getting on the saucer and, uh, no, no, no. The owner of the resort, no, the injured victim, rather than using his last name, the injured victim sees his wife getting on this flying saucer going down the hill and he's jealous and he actually takes it from her and now it's his turn. He sees she's having a great time. He sees that she loves going down and the thing's spinning and she comes up and goes down again and now he knows how this thing works. It's not a secret. 
He knows this. And what does he do after his wife finishes her run on the sled? Guess what he does? He wants to do it too. Now, here I'm coming in for the kill. This is a man who's an experienced winter sportsman. This is someone who's had previous experience hiking in winter. He's gone skiing before. He's done other winter activities. He's gone sledding, tobogganing, ice skating on a pond. Now how's that for risk taking? This is someone who knows dangers and risks, inherent risks in winter activities. So picture this. So here I am with the imagery. I want them to see it in their minds. I want them to feel it. Even though we're in the middle of the uh, springtime in 1990, they're sitting in a closed courtroom in Mineola here in New York in Nassau County. And now I want them to visualize. It's almost like close your eyes and picture this, okay? This is a tall man, 180 pounds, a smart man. Five feet, 11 inches tall, one inch short of six feet. Just picture it. He's getting on this little flimsy plastic dish, 30 inches, about 30 inches in diameter. That's two and a half feet wide. Picture this tall guy all bundled up with winter clothes, heavy jacket, pants, all set to go down. And he sits down in this little saucer that I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, was intended for children, not adults. Again, the visual imagery keeps coming up and I just keep reinforcing that because they have to understand, I have to keep hammering it over and over again. Why? Because they have to get the sense that this guy, this huge guy riding on, well, here's a little uh, plate, but you get the sense of a big guy sitting on a plate like this that just spins around going down a hill, right? That's what I want them to get the sense of. So he's building up speed uncontrollably, like a projectile. He gets in and it goes and it spins and he gets in voluntarily. Why? Because he gets that same wonderful feeling that his wife had. He wants that feeling of wind rushing through his hair. He wants that. And you know what? It's a great feeling to want. And when you get it, it's great. So why am I telling that jury that? I'm telling them because I want them to understand that this is a great sport. It's a great thing to do when you're out with the kids on a sledding hill after a nice snow. Ice snow? No, after a nice snowfall. But this wasn't the place, this wasn't the sled, this wasn't an adult-devised object. Instead, you got a little pie dish for this almost six foot tall guy, 180 pounds, and they've got to understand that. So here we go. This 34-year-old man on this little thing and he gets on it, knowing the dangers, disregarding the dangers, and he goes, what's happening? He's got 180 pounds of momentum going down. It's building up speed, going, going, going. And that's what these saucers do. And the plaintiff has testified that he did spin. He spun 180 degrees around and around and around. That's halfway around. So as he's going down, building up speed, he's coming down this hill with absolutely nothing, nothing to control it. And now, all of a sudden, he's facing upwards. His back toward the base of the hill, he's going backwards. And he testified he's able to steer this thing by shifting his weight. No, that's not happening. Well, how do you know where to steer if you're going backwards? How could you possibly know? There's just no possible way. So, now here's a little bit of math. I said plaintiff traveled. It's his testimony that he traveled 70 feet from the point where he got on that sled to the point where this incident occurred. 70 feet in four seconds. Four seconds. A little bit of math and the judge will give you a calculation. He'll give you a formula to determine how fast he was going. But if you merely divide the time it takes to travel 70 feet, you can determine how many feet you're going per second. That would be 17 and a half feet per second. Now, 17 and a half feet per second is kind of a hard concept to really understand. Most of us are familiar with traveling in cars, driving cars. We know about miles per hour. So let me show you what I did with the jury. And there's a simple formula that the judge will give you to determine by plugging a number into a formula to see how many feet per second equals miles per hour. Well, it actually comes out to 11 and a half to 12 miles per hour. Now driving a car doesn't seem like much, right? But in cars, we're used to going faster. But getting on this sled all alone in the nice winter air on a little dinky sled, remember? Little dinky sled, 180 pounds going faster and faster and spinning around. 
no way to steer. You're going down 11, 12 miles per hour. That's not slow at all. That's actually quite fast. That may be like riding on a bicycle down a hill, and this is fast. For a sled that's uncontrollable, that spins, you're really moving at speed. Now, the plaintiff, the injured victim, said he was moving pretty slow. Hey, Rob, objection, math. Okay, so we have an objection right now, and the objection is, what's the objection? Math. Yes, believe it or not, we actually use math in an accident case, and we do that to show to the jury the speed at which this guy was traveling. It's really important for the jury to understand, especially since I got this guy, this injured victim, to testify during his pretrial testimony that he was going pretty slow. Well, I can't just take his word for it because I wasn't there, we weren't there. So now I ask him questions. I ask him about the distance that he traveled from the time he got on that sled until the time of his incident. Then, in order to determine his speed, I now ask him the length of time it took to go from point A to point B. Once I know those two numbers, I can plug into a formula that will tell me exactly the speed at which he was traveling. And by the way, you should know, we use the same type of formula and calculation in car accident cases because we often will catch people in contradictions about the speed, the time, and the distance it took to travel a certain place from place to place using these particular calculations. So if I want to know the speed, I simply need to know the time it took to get there and the distance. If I want to know the distance they traveled, I can work backwards and re-engineer it by asking about the speed and the length of time. So three calculations, three elements, they may not be exact, but it helps us understand or at least get an estimate for their, uh, the speed at which they were traveling. So I hope that answered your objection, Rob, about math. All right, so let's get back on here. So now riding a bike, we're spinning, and the plaintiff said he was moving slow. If you're going slow on this thing, now here's the contradiction that I showed to the jury. If you're going slow, you're not having any fun on a sled. No kid, nowhere, ever has fun on a sled that slows down, that comes to a stop, that really is creeping along the hill. Nobody. If, they, if that's how people sledded, sledded, is that a word? Yes. If that's how people really went sledding, kids would never have fun. They would never go to a sledding hill. And you know what? Nobody would ever get on these things. Instead, the whole purpose is you want to go down fast, as fast as possible, because these are uncontrollable. That's why when you're on a sledding hill after a snowstorm, you need to be in an area that's far away from other people and objects and trees because you don't want to go near the possibility or run the risk of hitting something because you can't control it. Okay, so the only way, and I say this again, the only way to have a great time on this thing is if you're going fast. And ladies and gentlemen, he was going fast. So now, let's see, I want to see how many more pages I've got left before I get to the punchline here. All right, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to listen to the phone ringing. Ah, hang on one second. Hang on. Hey Dave, what's up? You okay, where are you? No, it didn't. I got my son at school on the phone with me. Um, you're okay? No, not yet. Dave, I'm in the middle of a Facebook Live video. You want to join in? How'd the test go? Yeah? Okay. All right, I'll see you a little while. Love you. Bye. Okay, that was my son calling from school. He just stayed uh, for extra help to see if uh, to prepare for a test for tomorrow. All right. What I want to do at this point is I'm going to wrap up today's episode without giving you the detailed comments at the very end because I'm going to save that for the next episode, but I will jump ahead and tell you what the result was in this particular case. The result was that the jury saw the version of events that occurred my way, my client's way. The jury determined that my client was not legally responsible for this guy's injuries. As unfortunate as his injuries were, the reality was that he did heal up from his fractured coccyx and he did not have any long-term significant injury or problem as a result of what occurred to him. And 
what's fascinating is that at the end of the case, a number of jurors came up to me and told me that being able to visualize and to see in their minds where this place was and what this guy experienced was so important for them in order to reach the conclusion that they did, which was that he did not and was not able to show that they were more likely right than wrong that the, this resort was legally responsible for his injuries. So that's it for today's episode, our second episode of Objection, Don't Answer That Question. Real cases, real lawyers, real results, real people, better than any reality show you can watch on TV today. So I want to thank you all for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this. If you're watching this on the replay on YouTube or Facebook or elsewhere, if you have questions, leave them in the comments below. Make sure you share this video with your friends. Tell them all about this new show, reality show called Objection. Don't answer that question. And I encourage you to join me on the next one where I'm going to be leading off with the last couple of pages of what occurred during my summation in this sledding accident case. Thanks again for watching. I'm Jerry Oginski. Have a wonderful day. Take care, everybody. Give it a thumbs up.